Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome to the second session of the Science for Citrus Health Spring Webinar Series, organized by Dr. Monique Rivera and Dr. Peggy Lameau. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM program, and Peter Cosina is also here with us to help run the poll questions and troubleshoot any technical problems. Please note that some of us are working from our homes and this might affect the quality of our audio. Please also note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Jawad Qureshi. Dr. Qureshi is an assistant professor of entomology at the Southwest Florida Research and Extension and Education Center. And today he will be talking about biological control of Asian citrus psyllid. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Dr. Qureshi. You can go ahead and share your slides. Well, uh, I appreciate the invitation uh, to speak with all of you today. And uh, I will be talking about the management of Asian citrus psyllid, uh, mainly focused on predators and parasites, uh, which are uh, useful uh, against this pest complex. Uh, this uh, insect is uh, now well established in Florida, California, and Texas, and also uh, in other citrus producing states. So the management of this insect is uh, important, uh, particularly because it's associated with a devastating disease, uh, which most of you are familiar, uh, probably working in citrus, it's called Hong Long Bing or citrus weaning disease. This insect was uh, identified from Florida in 1998. Uh, it's a small insect. Uh, Adults are about two millimeter and uh, females lay a couple of hundred eggs, uh, mainly in the newly developing birds and shoots uh, where they develop as nymphs and go through five uh, nymphal stages. So you can see a picture of uh, a shoot with eggs in the top right corner uh, and a picture with the nymphs uh, in, in the left down left corner. And you also see these nymphs, they go through uh, five uh, nymphal stages as they develop. Uh, and finally, after fifth instar, uh, they become adults. Uh, so basically, there are three life stages of these insects, eggs, nymphs, and adults. It's important to control this insect, uh, any pest, that you have in your groves, you don't want to uh, let them increase to the higher numbers where they become economically important for you. Uh, so it's important from that perspective and more importantly, because this insect is responsible for uh, vectoring the pathogens of long, long being or citrus screening disease. So from that perspective, even it's more important uh, in order to reduce the incidence and severity of the disease uh, to sustain your uh, current mature blocks and to protect your uh, uh, new blocks that you are planting. So basically when we look at the overall management, there are some short-term objectives. Uh, uh, when we talk about Asian citrus psyllid, obviously we want to control them uh, in our blocks. Uh, then we have to tackle that problem in multiple habitats. Uh, we have commercial production where we have organic and conventional uh, production systems. And then we also find uh, this insect in urban environments where we have citrus and it's a uh, relative host uh, orange jasmine planted. Uh, so these are our short term objectives, but how we want to go around uh, managing this problem, we need to uh, take into account our long term goals of uh, uh, pest management. Uh, sustainability is critical for agricultural and horticultural enterprises. Uh, we want to conserve the resources uh, irrespective of if it is biological control or chemical control. 
you don't want to be using excessive chemical control or repeating the same modes of actions because eventually you are going to lose the effectiveness with those products. And that's a loss uh, in itself. And similarly, uh, biological control gets damaged when you have uh, a very high level of uh, insecticide use. So, so, so as moving forward, we want to develop economical and environment friendly uh, approaches uh, for managing uh, this pest. We know that diseases here are more established and spread in some places and less in others. Uh, we have several options of uh, managing the vector, which is one of the key factors in dealing with this uh, vector pathogen complex. Uh, we have biological control, uh, where we use the beneficial insects to control uh, uh, this uh, pest. Then we have chemical control, uh, foliar sprays or soil applied applications, and the culture control. Uh, today, as I mentioned earlier, I am focusing more on the biological control, and, and you will definitely hear on the chemical part uh, in, in the other presentations. Uh, and as, as we move with this vector pathogen system, then you have the horticulture practices uh, that needs to be done properly, nutrition, irrigation, and soil management uh, to keep those trees healthy. In your groves, uh, you find several uh, beneficial organisms uh, among predators, uh, mainly the groups that you see are lady beetles, lacewings, uh, and the spiders. Uh, there are some uh, others as well, uh, like predatory mites or uh, this uh, minute pirate bug and several others. So they, they, they attack multiple pests. They are, they are generalist, uh, but these, some of these groups are very good predators of uh, Asian citrus cellars. Uh, then we have uh, the parasites, uh, which are more specific uh, to the species or your target pest. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, Tamarixia radiata, uh, which is a good parasite of Asian citrus psyllid. And then uh, you also have uh, several others uh, which attack uh, leaf miners, scales, and aphids. So it's basically a, a rich agroecosystem, and, and, and these uh, elements need to be uh, conserved and augmented uh, toward the sustainable and integrated management. Uh, approaches. Here in Florida, uh, when HLB was identified and soon after, uh, we looked at the impact of uh, biological control uh, on the populations of Asian citrus psyllid. Uh, and we noticed a very uh, high impact of uh, predation on the populations of uh, Asian citrus psyllid. Uh, the bars in this figure uh, uh, the dark orange ones are the ones uh, where the colonies in the grove were exposed, colonies of Asian citrus psyllid were exposed to the uh, beneficial organisms and the predators were able to feed on them. Where are the, the light color bars are the ones uh, that were protected with the sleeve cages. Yeah. And you see here that the or dark orange bar, that there was huge reduction uh, uh, mainly caused by uh, these predators, the pictures that you see below, the lady beetles, the lace wings, spiders. Uh, and, and that was, there were situations when those colonies were uh, completely uh, consumed, as you see here in, in June cohort uh, uh, from those uh, shoots. So th there was a huge impact of uh, these biological control agents uh, at that time. Obviously, uh, like I said earlier, we need to conserve uh, these resources. Uh, so chemical control is important part of this uh, management system. So how we can make uh, best use of uh, those insecticides. So one of the tactics are, are proof of the concept uh, that, that we did early on uh, was uh, that to try to target those uh, uh, harsh insecticides at time of the year, uh, when beneficial insects are, are not uh, very common in the groves. Uh, and for us here in Florida, that time is the winter period uh, when trees are not uh, producing the new growth uh, and psyllids are not reproducing and most of the other pests as well. 
like leaf miner or aphids. So the predators are not common in the groves. So this one application of uh, uh, chloropyrifos, uh, we were able to see the effect on the select populations for about, we did that in January, and then we were not seeing much select activity until April. And even later on in those blocks, the populations were uh, very low. And as I said, it was for the proof of concept. So we did not make additional applications uh, during the season. So if you see here the graphs on the right side, you will see that the lady beetles, the spiders and the lace wings, uh, they were common uh, in, in the blocks that were treated during the dormant winter period and the blocks that were not treated. So this, there was a good beneficial activity during the uh, growing season. Uh, when we talked about the chemical control, uh, uh, as I said earlier, we have organic and conventional production systems. So when we have tested these programs for uh, several years and seen that we see more suppression with the conventional insecticides, uh, but then the ones with organic insecticides used in combination with oil or soap uh, also provide a, a great reduction. And, uh, it's important that if we can integrate elements between these two uh, in order to uh, develop some integrated systems, which also uh, are more uh, useful for the biological control. These beneficial uh, arthropods, uh, obviously they do uh, a good job against Asian citrus alert, but as I said earlier, uh, they are very good predators of other pests as well. So here you see a larva of uh, Olavinigrum lady beetle uh, feeding on the nymph of Asian citrus salad. Uh, and on the picture on the right, uh, larva of the same species uh, feeding on the larva of citrus leaf miner, uh, which is also an important pest of uh, citrus crops. So then there are, the, there are several other species, like here I have a metallic blue lady beetle, uh, the larvae and adults. And uh, uh, they, we recently did some studies and they are also uh, very good predators of uh, Florida red scale. And some of these pests are hard to control with insecticides, unless you are really monitoring them, trying to key the times of the year and you can really target them. Otherwise you may be spraying. And if only the armored scales are there, you may not see a real huge impact of your applications. But these lady beetles, they, they have some very uh, interesting behaviors and they were able to feed uh, not only on the young crawler stages, uh, which can come out for, a, uh, for the armor for a short period before they establish and develop their armor, uh, but uh, on the fully matured females, which are completely covered with the, with the armor. So over the years, uh, obviously, like I said, chemical control is an important part because of the HLB factor. So uh, it was happening. And uh, what, what we observed in, in some of the programs that we have tested that uh, the two uh, groups that were more common were the, the lace wings and the spiders. Uh, but the lady beetle species, uh, their numbers were very low. And that was not the situation uh, when early on we did those studies for which I showed you the impact. So the lady beetle populations have gone considerably down uh, because of the use of uh, insecticides. Lace wings uh, uh, as a group are also a very important predator of not only for the Asian citrus survey, but as as well as for several other pests uh, in, in citrus crops. And uh, uh, we, we encountered them from time to time, like you saw on the previous slide that uh, they were one of the important groups we were still finding after uh, so many years of insecticide use uh, in the groves. So we have been doing some uh, work recently on, on looking at their uh, abundance and, and distribution uh, in, in different management program. Uh, as we gathered information from those previous uh, CRB funded projects on organic and conventional programs, and now uh, testing some uh, integrated pest management programs by combining some of those elements uh, through funding from uh, 
Citrus Research and Development Foundation. So, so these are some of the programs that we are, uh, we are testing. For example, we have program with conventional and organic insecticides and biological control. Then organic insecticide with horticulture, mineral oil, and biological control. Conventional insecticides with biological control. Horticulture, mineral oil with biological control and biological control by itself. So these programs are right now are going on in, in large scale uh, field studies. And uh, we kind of see a similar trend uh, in terms of abundance of these predatory groups. Uh, it's, 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 it's the same situation that I saw one of the previous slides. The spiders are uh, the most abundant group and, and followed by the the lace wings and the lady beetle populations are uh, almost uh, negligible uh, most of the times. So we started looking into these lace wings uh, uh, and uh, trying to see which species we see. And one of the most important species that we see here, the green bars, is uh, Sarocrasa cubana. And you see that uh, it's kind of found in all those programs uh, compared to Rufilibaris and clary, which are at very low levels, are some uh, unidentified uh, species. So it seems that maybe as we uh, know that it's common that the pests, they develop resistance to these insecticides or tolerance, uh, some of these beneficial insects uh, most likely are going through the uh, same route. So then we started testing uh, some, some of these species uh, again, some of the commonly used uh, insecticides in the citrus groves. And here I'm showing the example for uh, imidacloprid and uh, see that uh, there was significant mortality for uh, Sarocrysa clowry, uh, but for Sarocrysa cubana, uh, those populations uh, were able to tolerate this insecticide uh, to some level. So the, the, those, those were the findings from what, what we are seeing uh, uh, out there in the groves. And then my lab, uh, we are also working on some of the commercially available uh, predators uh, uh, and, and trying to see their potential against the Asian citrus alert. So we have convergent lady beetle, uh, millibug destroyer, two spotted lady, be lady beetle, brown lace wings, uh, and predatory mites. And I will share just a few slides on some of those. So for the convergent lady beetle, uh, we tested this species against the Asian citrus alert, brown lace wings, and the, sorry, brown citrus aphid and the green citrus aphid. Uh, and it developed and reproduced well on all those diets. Uh, the growers in Florida released uh, several millions of those lady beetles. Uh, and that was done before we were able to actually evaluate this species. So they were really desperate and wanted to release predators into their growth. And that was a species that was commercially available. Uh, but we have not really seen uh, its establishment in, in the citrus groves. Uh, we definitely have seen their numbers go up in the vegetable production systems, uh, but not uh, so much uh, in, in the citrus crops. Uh, then we also tested uh, two spotted lady beetle uh, here on, on the top and then the brown lace wings. Uh, they also developed uh, and reproduced on the diet of Asian citrus alert. And then we did some field experiments uh, by caging them with silicate colonies. And we also found that the brown lace wing can cause up to 35% reduction in the nymphal colonies, uh, whereas this uh, two-spotted lady beetle can cause up to 56% reduction. Uh, the large scale releases in the groves and their evaluation is still pending on, on, on these organisms. Uh, we also tested the predatory mite uh, Amblycia swirskii again in control conditions and uh, did observe that uh, where we released those mites uh, on the infested uh, potted plants, uh, the emergence of cellars from those plants were reduced by uh, more than uh, 80%. Uh, we did do a very large uh, scale study uh, a couple of years ago uh, when Dr. Phil Stensley was alive. It was a huge effort uh, and, and we released uh, about half a million of those predatory mites uh, in, in one of the citrus uh, um, blocks. But unfortunately we were 
are not able to document uh, their establishment or impact from, uh, from, from those studies. Uh, recently, we are uh, conducting some more work and hopefully uh, I will have uh, some findings uh, in the coming months to share. The parasite Tamaraxia radiata, uh, most of you work in citrus and no Asian citrus salad are common. It's, uh, it's one of the important parasites of this insect. Uh, for us here in Florida, that is the only one uh, that is established and contributing to salad mortality. Uh, the work over there in California sh shows uh, by Mark Hardell uh, that even diaphor insertus oligorensis uh, is also established and contributing to, to some levels. Uh, basically, uh, the females of the parasite uh, lay their egg on the salad nymph. If you can see it here, it's kind of similar creamy color as, as the body of the psyllid. And uh, as the larva uh, starts to develop, they consume the body contents, a pupate, and then finally the uh, final and star nymphs are mummified, and then the adults uh, come out and, and continue the process. So basically this parasite uh, attacks the nymphs of Asian citrus psyllid and mainly fourth and fifth in stars. These were some studies we did uh, a couple of years ago, and that was basically based on very initial releases that were made in Florida uh, in 99 and 2000. And these studies were done in 2006 and seven. Uh, those lim releases were limited, uh, but still the parasite establishment was reported and the levels of parasitism that we saw, they were not very high. Mostly it was less than 20% uh, with uh, higher levels up to 40 and 60% uh, at some locations. So from that point and thereafter, uh, we started here working on bringing these parasites from different region uh, and the mass releases started in Florida on more regular basis. And uh, those releases also uh, started in California and uh, Texas as well. So with some of the studies that we have done with this parasite, uh, we have seen that uh, it, 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 it has shown potential to, to improve the rates that we were initially seeing and uh, also shown potential to establish in the, the organic programs. Uh, uh, compared to the conventional programs, as you see here, the red bar, uh, we did not find uh, good parasitism rates in the conventional programs, even uh, when the NIMS were available uh, in, in those programs. Uh, here is another example uh, where those releases were being made in, in one of the locations. And again, here, even we did see even more encouraging results uh, in the blocks where the use of conventional insecticides was uh, less. We did have some applications made, uh, but those were well separated and done only a few times compared to if you see these red and pink bars, uh, those were the program where insecticide spray or use was uh, uh, more heavy and uh, the level of parasitisms were uh, uh, below 20%. So overall, uh, based on this and some of the other work that, that we have done, we, we have seen that those predators and parasites, uh, especially the parasite Tamaraxia radiata, they show significant potential uh, in suppressing the cellular populations. Uh, it's, it's important to understand that uh, when we look at these parasitism rates, uh, they, they may seem low, but it's important to understand that we are dealing with the insect, which has a very high reproductive rate. And even targeting a one female of Asian citrus psyllid uh, means that you, you are basically suppressing three to four progeny of, uh, of that female. And with a sex ratio of 50-50, uh, still at least uh, two, 200, uh, 200 females to further uh, progress that population. And those populations are there even in the commercial settings where we are using the insecticides. That means the insecticides are not completely eliminating those populations uh, from those situations. So that's why uh, it's, it's important uh, to pay attention to these uh, other methods of control as well so that we can 
maintain them and, and keep them in some form and shape as we move forward uh, so that we don't get onto the path of sole reliance on, on just one control method uh, that might not be enough for us and for the different production systems uh, that we have. So successful integrated area-wide citrus pest management is going to require uh, use of all these available tools, including the biological control. Uh, and, and we continue to evaluate uh, biological control and IPM currently uh, uh, in different uh, production systems, including the, the open uh, traditional production systems, as well as uh, the protected, protected systems, uh, uh, which are kind of now uh, uh, established to a good level in Florida and, and also uh, initiated in California and, and maybe other locations uh, as well. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all our funding sources uh, from Citrus Research Board to Citrus Research and Development Foundation and the state and federal agencies uh, that fund our programs, the growers, the division of plant industry, and the members of uh, my lab, uh, my biological scientists, the postdocs, uh, research assistants, and uh, thank you very much for your patience. Okay, excellent. <laughs> we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, one person, I think you might have answered this already. One person asked, have you evaluated the impact of T radiata host feeding on ACP? Uh, no, we have not uh, done that. But there was a study uh, done several years ago. I think where, where they looked at those effects and also uh, of parasitization. And from there, they came uh, to the conclusion that I think a single female uh, can destroy up to uh, 500 nymphs uh, uh, during their uh, during their lifespan. Okay, um, and I'll, I think we'll do one more question. One person asked, when releasing the predators such as lady beetles in orchards, is there a trick to getting them to stay in the orchard and not fly away? Uh, that's a good and interesting question. And uh, that's always a concern. Uh, I mean, the natural way of uh, keeping them will be that if, if you have the prey available uh, in, in those blocks. So if you have some level of uh, pest infestation and uh, that may be an attraction for them uh, to stay uh, in those blocks. But beside that, there, there, there are other ways of uh, uh, keeping them uh, uh, in, in the groves. And uh, Lucas Telensky, they have done some work uh, and Lucas may be able to comment on that. Uh, if uh, there are some other methods which uh, uh, which can be used as an attraction, uh, food sources uh, which can be placed in the blocks, and uh, that may help as well. But uh, it's it's always a concern, and it, it's the same uh, situation with the Tamarixia radiata. Uh, that when you release those organisms in those blocks, it's, it's not a guaranteed thing uh, that they are going, going to stay there. So, it, but, but again, it, the, the, when, when, when we talk about that, again, the whole concept of uh, area-wide management kicks in. So like we talk about the area-wide management for insecticide use, so it is same uh, for, for the biological control. If, if more people in, in the region are, are working on the conservation uh, and th those approaches, augmentation, um, being careful with the, with the use of insecticides and all that, then there will be more favorable habitats for them uh, to, to kind of stay and establish themselves uh, rather than if, if there are more uh, use of insecticides and the chemicals that are more hazardous, uh, then we will keep killing most of those populations and, and they, they may uh, start avoiding as well and, and trying to go to the habitats where, where uh, I mean, urban areas could be one, uh, but, but other cropping systems as well. Okay, thank you. We do have other questions, but I think I'll save them for the panel discussion. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Mamuru Setamu. Dr. Setamu is a professor of agronomy and resource sciences at Texas A&M University. 
Today, he will be talking about phenology-based sprays for Asian citrus psyllid and area-wide ACP management in Texas. Dr. Setamu, I'll pass this over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning all or good afternoon, wherever you might be. My presentation will be on the importance of uh, flush cycle as determinant of uh, psyllid population fluctuation and uh, how can we exploit this uh, tree-based phenology to optimize psyllid management in area-wide management program. So I'll be briefly talking about the impact of flush cycle in ACP population. Uh, this is what I call here importance of uh, flush cycle in ACP dynamics, and how can we optimize ACP management using this uh, information and uh, find, finish my presentation with a quick update on area-wide management of uh, psyllid in Texas. To study the factors governing uh, ACP population fluctuation in Texas, we conducted some field monitoring studies uh, in about 153 growth. And we did those studies from uh, January 2009 to February 2010. So we have 153 growth that we sample in both grapefruit. You see 99 grapefruit growth and 54 uh, sweet orange growth. And uh, at each sampling site, we created a transect. And the transect consisted of three trees. We have one tree at the border and one tree toward the uh, inside of the grove, what I call inward border tree, and one tree randomly selected at the interior. And for each tree, we collected flush shoot or we sampled flush shoot, and we enumerated the different life stages of psyllid, you know, eggs, nymph, and the adult. And in addition to that, we placed embedded sticky cards at each of those three to monitor adult population, and uh, those traps were replaced every two weeks. So at the end, what we did, we did a variance component analysis with a statistical procedure to determine which factors contribute to the variation of psyllid population. And at the end, we were able to identify seven factors. The variety was playing a critical role. We have differences uh, in uh, psyllid density depending on the variety. Generally, the lime and lemon have all more psyllid than oranges. Oranges were second in that group, and grapefruit was the least, you know, infested with uh, psyllid, what we observed. And the type of irrigation also influenced psyllid population fluctuation. Uh, just, you know, we do still have some growth here that are flood irrigated, and whenever people flood irrigate, you know, we have profuse flush cycle that followed two, two weeks later, and that impact silly population. So flood irrigation was, uh, you know, having more silly. The time of the year is important. Here in Texas, we see more silly uh, in fall from September to October, because this is when we got, we get most of our rainfall in fall. So we had higher silly population during that time. The tree location within the grove was also important tree at, at the border have more psyllid than adjacent tree and the interior trees were the least infested. Now, if you take a cluster of grove, if you take a cluster of grove, grove that are on the outside of those clusters that are not surrounded by other grove tended to have more psyllid than a grove that were inside the cluster. And the growth age was also very important. You know, younger grove have more psyllid than mature growth. And the younger growth that we took here is from zero to five years old. This is how we classify the younger growth. But the most important factors that uh, control psyllid population was the flush cycle, when we have flush cycle, when we have new flush growing. And you can see here, 61% of the variation in adult population was determined by flush cycle, but 77% of the variation in eggs. And why is it so? Eggs and nymphs are only present when we have, you know, flush cycle. So that makes perfect sense. But if you look at all the life, uh, life stages of psyllid, the most important factor was flush cycle. That is a major determinant of psyllid population. So we try here to plot the variation in uh, immatures, eggs and nymphs through time, you know, during the study. And as you can see, 
uh, you only have eggs and nymph when you have the during the discrete flood cycles. And for adults, although adults were present year round, but their population level was influenced by the presence of flood cycle. So it's during flood cycle we also see uh, an increase in adult population in uh, in the growth. So to summarize this study, we can say that. Uh, Flood cycle are the main driver of ACP population fluctuation. And uh, during flood cycle is as if the green light is turned on in the grove. The green light, you know, the switch is on that recruit more silage into the grove for egg laying and for reproduction. And at the end of the flood cycle, the light goes off and silage tend to move out of the grove. But this is just at the silage population regulation level. But now we have more information that in addition to regulating silid population, the flow cycle also influenced the interaction between silid and the bacterial causal agent of uh, HLB. We know that you know, during flow cycle, the acquisition of CLAS by ACP is enhanced. You know, we've done some studies here back in 2015-16. We realized that whenever we have flow cycle, adults, 2.74 more adults are e able to acquire the bacteria during flow cycle compared to when there is no flow cycle on the same plant. And some studies done in Japan and also here in Florida that when silid acquired the bacterium at the nymphal stage, the adult that emerged is more an efficient, more efficient vector than if they acquire it as adults. And when can silid acquire the bacterium as a nymph? When you have flow cycle. And David Hall and collaborators also show that, show that the transmission of CLAS by ACP is enhanced or increased when you have flow cycle. And in 2009, a paper published by Ibanez and Stelensky showed that flow cycle also regulates the bacteria tighter in the league, in the in the plants. So whenever you have flow cycle, you have higher concentration of bacteria. So as you can see, if we want to summarize everything, flow cycle is at the centerpiece of regulating silid population and also controlling the dynamics, you know, the disease transmission and the, you know parameters. So it is important then during flow cycle to prevent increase in silid population, but also to re by re reduce the risk of HLB spread. And as, as a summary, you see here, when you have flow cycle, you have higher colonization of growth by adult, you have oviposition and immature development and an increase in vector population. This is you know, how it affects silid. And now on the other side, you have increase in CLAS concentration in leaves, and you have enhanced acquisition and transmission and the risk of HLB spread increase when you have flow cycle. So if you have to effectively control silage to prevent the spread of HLB, you have at all costs to prevent the reproduction, successful reproduction. And this, you can only do that during flow cycle. And in your case in California, I think it's very critical. I know that you still have some growth where HLB, with AC, where ACP is not established. The only way you can prevent establishment of uh, silage in those growth is to prevent reproduction. You may not be able to prevent colonization, initial colonization, because they are spreading freely, but you can prevent establishment in those growth by controlling effectively silage. So we hypothesize that the best way to control silage, for instance, will be to spray the whole growth during flow cycle to prevent you know, reproduction. So as you can see here, we did a small field test where we compared two treatments. We have a whole growth spray at the onset. This is very critical at the onset, you know, at the beginning of the flow cycle when silage are present. So you prevent egg laying and any immature development. And we complemented this whole growth spray during flow cycle with border spray between flow cycle. So, and the second treatment that we use to compare is the traditional, 
in threshold-based spray, and the threshold we've defined here for this study was 20% of flush shoot infested with adult, combined with either 10% of flush shoot infested with immature, either eggs or nests. So, and the border spray were applied with either a commercial insecticide, oil plus, you know, or kaolin and so forth. Whereas our spray were done by different active ingredients because we have to spray several times during the year. So this is the layout of uh, our experimental plot. On the left side, you see T1 here. This is where we did the phenology-based spray, the flush-based spray. So when we have flush starting, we spray the whole growth. It's whole growth spray. And between flush cycle, we do here a border spray represented by this uh, white band. You know, sometimes it contains kaolin. That's why we put a white band. And the block on the right side here, T2, is a traditional threshold base spray. And we compare silic population for the whole year by deploying 10 trap in each treatment. And this is uh, what we got in terms of silic population through time. And the arrows indicate when we spray. The blue arrow indicate when we spray in the threshold base spray. And you remember this was T2. And the red arrow indicate when we spray in the phenology based spray program. And the red rectangle here are when we did the border spray in between flush cycle. So throughout the year, population were very comp were comparable, statistically similar with the exception of uh, you know, late September, when we had some heavy rain, we got some heavy rain early September and the grove were flooded. So we couldn't go and spray on time in the flood cycle base. So that is why we saw this spike. So what we decide to do is to compare what we call the cumulative number of silic between those two treatment. And when you compare the cumulative number of silic, you do not have any, significant difference. So bo both treatment were equivalent. And if I step back a little bit, sorry, I step back a little bit, we can count here how many times we spray in the flow cycle base, we spray six times. The red one plus this black line here, black arrow, you know, we spray six times, the whole growth, and three times as border spray. Whereas in the threshold base spray, we spray nine times the whole growth. So this is a difference. So we have, you know, a difference in chemical input. Jawad was talking about reducing chemical, you know, input, for instance, to reduce the risk, you know, to save costs and reduce the risk in the negative impact on beneficial. So the flow cycle base save us pesticide, whereas it's equally as effective as threshold based spray, you know, for ACP control. So this is what we observe, and we try to calculate the pesticide saving we got. In our trial, we got nearly 23% pesticide saving, which was substantial, because if you add additional costs, such as cost of application, that makes some substantial saving for the grower. So now, how do we integrate all this information into our ongoing area-wide management program? We started here an area-wide management program back in 2010, and this program has evolved through time. The current, currently implemented program was defined in 2016. That comprises what we call coordinated spray and flush-based spray at the onset, and I will explain. So we have three coordinated spray, two dormant spray, we do two dormant spray, we start generally in November at the end of a season. This is the first dormant spray. And we have a second dormant spray in early February before the spring flush. You know, we, in Texas here, we fall back late, but we spring up early. So this is the situation. So that is why we, we define our uh, dormant spray during those times. And we have what we call a proactive coordinated spray that we do in late August. I said earlier, we get intense rain here in September. So we have a very calcareous soil. You can get in, run a tractor in a grove in September because of flooding issues. So what we do late August, we do a coordinated spray. And those sprays are done generally by most of the growers. And those coordinated spray 
with the exception of the two dormant spray, the August one is also a multi-pest with target might and scale during, during that time. So in addition to these three sprays, we recommend to grower to do what we call individual growth spray at the onset of a flush cycle from March to August. So from March to August, when you see a flush cycle and you are seeing some silly, then you can go and do your spray. And you may complement that with a border spray. So this is a snapshot you know, of our area-wide management program that we implement here in Texas. The yellow bars indicate when we do the coordinated spray, as you can see, there are three coordinated spray. And uh, the orange bar indicate when grower do their individual you know, whole growth spray at the onset of a flush cycle. It's so important, onset. And the blue bars here indicate when they can do you know, some border spray. So this is the program that we use in any conventional growth. And in organic growth, the difference is that they spray here more frequently, more frequently. But in any growth, convention type of production system, conventional or, or organic, we do some releases of beneficial from March to May, not for silage. Those biocontrol efforts are for other pests millibugs scale essentially. Why? Because of the high input of chemical, we tend to have destroyed some beneficial organism through time. Now we incorporate most of those beneficial. We buy them either from California or Arizona and we use generally a millibug destroyer, you know, uh, that uh, Cryptolemus that uh, Jawad just mentioned. And we buy a lot of a fighters, you know, from scale parasito that we release in all, you know, area-wide releases to inseminate or re-inseminate those beneficial. So this is what we do in Texas. And uh, here is snapshot of how silid population has evolved. I said we started our area-wide management program in 2010. Uh, we were using a different method of monitoring from 2010 to 2013. Uh, but from 2013, we have now 210 sentinel growth that we are monitoring, you know, using a consistent method. That is why I'm presenting the data on, you know, our silid population from 2013. As you can see, we did very well. This was the level in 2013. The population dropped significantly through time. But what we note, noted is that in 2018, we got an increase, a spike in silid population. So we decided to understand what was going on. And if you can see here, this is the participation rate. You know, what is the participation rate is the report we got from growers on how many acres they put on the area-wide management. And this report basically is for the three coordinated spray. Because for the, if somebody is doing a coordinated spray, we assume he's participating in the area-wide management. And they report back to the Texas Pest and Disease Management Corporation, and we derive those percentages. So as you can see, in 2018, we got a drop in participation rate. So that is why we think, because we have lower acreage that was on the area-wide management, that is why we have this spike. And these are the critical event here of our area-wide management. We started in January, 2010. In August, 2014, we put a third coordinated spray in August. And in January, 2016, we started the phenology-based spray. But what can we derive from this? We never reach 100% participation. So if anybody has any secret to tell us, you know, how we can uh, have all the growers on board. You know, we are willing to listen to them. We try all our effort. But at the same time, you need to continue your outreach program because we were kind of lax in 2017 and 18 in terms of outreach and education. And immediately that following year, people thought the program was over. They don't have to participate. And we got a significant drop in the participation rate. So. To summarize the challenges we face in the implementation of our area-wide management is that silage sprays are difficult to sustain. And many growers you know, were feeling the silage fatigue. You know? So if in your messaging in, in uh, California, you should avoid you know, just 
hammer and go on seed only. You need to have a combination of outreach activities where growers can listen to silly talk, but also to other pests uh, and other you know, topics. So be strategic about your silly control outreach program. It's important. But the outreach need to continue. You cannot be lax. You cannot you know, say, well, we, we achieve high level population of drop and we should forget about outreach. It will reverse back very quickly if you don't, if you don't have a sustained effort. And my strategy or the strategy I'm recommending is to consider implementing a multi-pest control strategy. This is very critical. And the opportunity we have in citrus production or citrus pest management, it is a many citrus pests, many, not all, tend to be related or to be regulated by the flush shoot. If you take leaf miner, if you take aphid and some soft scale, the population increase with the flush cycle. So try to have this multi-pest control strategy, not just seal it only. And uh, on that note, I wanna thank you for your participation. Give you a snapshot of our growth last year. This, uh, this is a picture of our growth last year. And after mid uh, February, this is how they look like now. So we have a much more bigger problem. We are trying to revive those growth. So this is where we are. Um, and um, while we're waiting, maybe you, uh, um, I'll ask the question, um, can growers afford all those sprays? The, that can be very costly in California, especially in a poor market. Yeah, well, you guys are fortunate in California, you don't have the same number, you know, you don't have high number of flush cycle. And uh, if you go by the threshold base, as I showed here, threshold base tend, you know, to include more sprays than, um, you know, the phenology based spray. If my understanding is correct, in some areas in California, you have two flush cycle or three, or four, so I don't know, maybe you guys need to help me here. So definitely, if you compare the different region with the phenology-based spray, California will have less chemical input than any other region in the US. With, of course, the, the, the difference of uh, lemon grove areas. Um, I think we will move on to our next speaker. Okay. We have a lot of questions for the panel discussion. Um, our third and final speaker is Dr. Lucas Stolinski. Dr. Stolinski is a professor of entomology and nematology at the University of Florida. Today, he will describe the relationship between ACP density and tree stress, as well as thresholds for control. Dr. Stolinski, I will now pass this over to you. All right, I'm gonna try not to contradict my colleagues, but I wanna give a little caveat to introduce my talk. I am going to talk about a situation in Florida where we have 100% infection. So this is different from California, and this is very, this is still different from uh, Texas. So this is, um, I'm coming to you from a position you don't want to be in, uh, hopefully ever. And uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about how we approach life with this disease when everyone is infected and everyone is 100% infected. And it's a, it's a very different story. So, and we're in a situation where unfortunately production uh, has been reduced by 70% by, by now. I mean, these numbers may be higher. So Mamudu Sedamu, Professor Sedamu mentioned psyllid fatigue. Um, and it's, it, it is that in Florida. And it's also the, the economic challenges of, of trying to survive when, when growers are, are no longer seeing profits. Um, so with 100% infection, um, a number of years ago now, uh, the, the very uh, logical question uh, emerged in Florida of, of whether it makes any sense to control the vector at all anymore. Uh, and, and this was a, a difficult question um, that um, Mamudu and I at least took a stab at, at, at trying to answer. And I'll, I'll present some of those data. But by that time, we had some, um, some 
observations based on field data. Some of these came from uh, these observations. A lot of these early observations were generated by the laboratory of the late Dr. Stansley, which suggested that even under 100% HLB infection, that the sprays were having some effect where he did studies where he would go into groves that were 100% infected and he would set up replicated trials, he and his uh, colleagues and people that worked in his laboratory. And they would apply various treatments in a randomized and replicated fashion where they would um, leave some areas untreated. They would treat certain areas with insecticides. Some areas they would only give additional fertilization and some they gave a combination of both. And this was very much during the time when we were still interested also just, just we're learning about how how fertilizing trees themselves would, would help the problem. And anyway, curiously, what, what they started to find was, was despite the fact that all trees were equivalently infected, um, that, that simply reducing the, the populations of psyllids had an impact on yield, um, a positive impact on yield. Um, and so again, the reason this was curious was that, well, you know, everybody, all the, you know, all the trees in the control are infected and all the trees in the, uh, in the, where, where, where psyllids are spare infected. What, what is, what is reducing that population of psyllids doing that it's, that it's improving yield. And, and by the way, this, so this would suggest that, that psyllid sprays still, still matter, but, 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 so we, we chose to, to try to address this question in, in an experiment. And, and my hypothesis at that time um, was that, uh, and, and this was, this, I think uh, this was something that popped into a lot of people's mind, was that the, the tree health was affected by the frequency of pathogen inoculation. So if you had a bunch of psyllids around, even though the tree was infected already, if it gets more psyllids pumping more bacteria into it, then it's going to be somehow more infected, right? There's, there's going to be greater titers of pathogen, and, and this greater pathogen load will make it sicker. This, this sound, I mean, I'm, I'm not a plant pathologist, but this, this sounded kind of logical to me at the time. So we chose to, to test this hypothesis. And um, we did this both in, in, in a laboratory setting and in a, in a larger field kid setting. And the treatments were rather simple. And, and inoculate the trees one time. And, and all of these, this is all replicated and the trees either get psyllids that carry the bacteria or uninfected psyllids. And by one time, I mean a, a weak access to those trees. Uh, and so this would, this would, and then you measure the trees for a couple of years and you, you measure everything you can. Another treatment would be to inoculate them with pulses. And, and they get a pulse, they, they get exposed to psyllids for a week every month. And this to me sort of replicated what growers in Florida were experiencing, those growers that were using insecticides to manage psyllids because you'd spray every month. We weren't, we weren't following a flush phenology model. We weren't following um, a threshold. We were spraying on a calendar. Every month a spray went out. Um, uh, so that's, that's about you know, 11, 12 sprays a year. Um, uh, so every month a spray would go out. And by the end of the month, that, that, grove, that spray grove would start to get infested again from either surrounded abandoned groves or areas that weren't uh, treating for silk. Um, the insecticides have a, you know, they degrade under UV light and, and psyllids migrate back in. So we do this either with, with psyllids that are hot or, or psyllids that are cold. And then the final treatment is to have a continuous population of psyllids. And in the cases of the ones on the left-hand side here that have bacterium, these plants are experiencing at all times, eggs, nymphs, and adults continuously re being, becoming re-inoculated. So that, that, those bacteria are constantly being sucked up and spit out by, by the next generation, um, which I, this would be the opposite side of the spectrum of the one-time inoculation. And then we just monitor these, um, uh, collect uh, 12 mature leaves, or the same 12 mature leaves, by the way, are analyzed from each plant um, every month. And we go back and hold punch them. And we, 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 we did a battery of tests, including titer of the pathogen, but also we were looking at um, the, the plant defense response, which I'm only going to get into briefly during this talk. Anyway, the results were quite, um, quite unexpected to me, at least. This shows the titer of pathogen over time. 
Um, and the, the uh, squares are the one-time inoculation. The um, uh, triangles are the continuous population of slows that are constantly picking up and spitting bacteria into the plant. And then the circles, which really don't even register on this uh, y-axis, the titers are so low, are the ones that are getting uh, inoculated every month. And this is only the three treatments with the hot silos because the cold silos, the ones that didn't have bacteria, those plants never became infected. So anyway, what's curious about these results? You know, number one, there's no difference between a one-time inoculation and a population of plants that are constantly being re-inoculated. So pathogen titer does not appear to be uh, related to inoculation frequency. The other curious result was that the, the titer in those plants that are getting infested for, for one and a half or almost two years in our studies were, had lower titers of pathogen than the one plants that only got inoculated once at the beginning of the study. Um, and then you could see that this pathogen titer tends to kind of fluctuate. There's, there's these three peaks. And, and, and that, that's pretty easily explained by what Dr. Sedema uh, already talked about in that the, the titer of the pathogen tends to be related to flushing. Um, we believe this to be uh, due to the, you know, the, the bacteria in the phloem, and, and there's a lot of source to shoot movement of phloem during the, the, the growth of the new flush. So we think the bacteria is getting pumped out of the roots and into the leaves um, during those periods of, of, of intense flushing. Um, so the, here are some pictures of some larger trees that Mamudu did as part of his experiment, which had essentially the, the same treatments. The top three trees are ones that had um, the HLB and then the, 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 three, the three levels of um, ACP. Here where it says no ACP, um, in our case, these would have been infested just in the, in the very beginning with, a, with, with either infected or uninfected ACP. In his case, he had no ACP. This, the, the, and the bottom ones have no, no pathogen, just silks. And you get, you get the two in the center are pulsed either with infected or infected psyllids and, and then the continuous population. So what's the, the, the kind of bottom line here um, uh, result? Um, in, in the one-time inoculation, you know, you, you get them infected with the bacteria and, and you don't get psyllids. In, in our more controlled experiment, we saw that if they had bacteria and, and they saw psyllids once, you know, they kind of had intermediate health, but those trees didn't decline, at least during the, the portion of our uh, experiment to the point of death. You know, they're just kind of, they, they look a little worse. Of course, if they had psyllids once and, and those psyllids were uninfected, those, those trees look good to the very end. Curiously, again, the, the, the pulse treatments, whether or not the psyllids were infected or uninfected, those trees look pretty good throughout the experiment. And it was where they had continuous populations of psyllids and, and especially pathogen, where those trees really crashed. Um, and and they, they didn't look good without the pathogen either. Just, just psyllids alone in, a, in an enclosed space are, are going to do um, a lot of damage to the plant. So we, we looked at this and what we found, uh, and again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to present all these data, but the, the, the pulses of psyllids tend to turn on um, plant defense responses. And, and, and we think that these plant defense responses uh, uh, help the, the tree uh, uh, deal with, with the bacterial infection. The, the tree uh, appears to uh, react to psyllid infestation and pathogen infection very similarly if you just look at gene expression and, and, and production of metabolites. Now what the continuous population or continuous infection of psyllids does is it tends to eventually turn those defenses off. And we believe then the, 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 the tree is no longer able to, to, to deal with, with defending itself or fending off, off the pathogen. So general observations here, are the plants respond to pulses of ACP feeding with a boost of plant defenses. We're not sure exactly if they're doing this against the pathogen, the, the, the symptom expression. These are still open questions that we're investigating. One thing that we're pretty certain of is that long-term feeding by the psyllids suppresses these immune defense responses and it inhibits growth, which may explain the importance of that vector suppression of, as part of HLB management. 
So I always seem to have uh, falsified the hypothesis that the trees are getting sicker because they have more pathogen. They appear to be getting sicker because the tree can't deal with the existing pathogen load that it has. So ACP management is beneficial, but at least in Florida, we need to make it more sustainable because we've been on this treadmill of 12 insecticide sprays per year that growers can no longer handle economically and our, and our growers are moving away from. So can we reduce this frequency and maintain or improve profit? These um, results that I'm going to start to present to you next are, are not meant to um, uh, discredit or, or in any way um, contradict what, what Dr. Sedamu previously presented. We're, we're, we're trying a, um, a, uh, an economic threshold approach, but you see we're approaching it from a different starting point. We're, we're approaching it from a calendar-based approach where any reduction in sprays is, is something. And, and so Phil Stansley uh, again asked, well, can, can we start using a threshold? And here's, here's a really telling experiment that he ran where he, in the same area, in the same areas, these are two locations where he did a 0.2 psyllids per tap threshold a 0.7 psyllids per tap threshold versus a calendar spray versus a no spray control. And what, are, do, what do I mean by these 0.2 and 0.7 psyllids per tap thresholds? 10 trees per block are sampled by the tapping method where you take a branch on a tree, you, you, you tap it um, and, and you count all the psyllids that fall off of that branch on a, on a, um, a a sampling plate that's about the size of a sheet of paper. And you count all the sills that fell off. And then you take an average of 10 trees. And if, it if it's 0.2 sillids from those two, two, two trees, less than one psyllid per tree, then, then you spray. You've, you've, you've reached your threshold. So you can see these thresholds are quite low um, versus a count. Now, what, what does this have practically uh, on the number of sprays? Well, his calendar uh, applications had 10 sprays. While he only reached the 0.2 per tap threshold four times and the 0.7 uh, uh, psyllid per tap threshold twice. So you can see it reduced the number of sprays. Now, what did he find in terms of yield and profit? Well, in both cases, in both locations, his highest yield was with the monthly spray, which makes sense. The psyllid populations were lowest during those, in, in those areas. The, the trees were likely the most healthy and possibly for the reasons I just talked about that the, 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 the psyllids weren't affecting the, the, they weren't causing enough damage to affect the, the tree's natural immune response and, and defense response to the pathogen, the best in those cases. But what he found was he found no difference in profit between the calendar sprays and 0.2 psyllids per tap in, in the, the location one and actually in location two in the bottom, he found that he got his highest profit in the 0.2 psyllids per tap threshold tree. Meaning that in the calendar based spray, growers were actually wasting money by spraying when they didn't need to spray. The investment was, did, did not uh, pay for, was not paid for by, by the actual uh, yield that was uh, received. So we've been continuing this and we've been trying to um, look at different thresholds in different areas. And we've been looking at economic thresholds. These are essentially nominal thresholds. And we're trying to move from, from nominal thresholds to economic thresholds because these are still ballparks. And we're comparing 0.2 psyllids per, per tap, 0.5 psyllids per tap and, and one psyllid per tap. And one thing that we find is with some of these lower thresholds, we're, we're, we're just having a hard time keeping psyllids below the threshold. Again, we're coming from a very different perspective than where you are in California currently, where our, our, our psyllid populations are much higher. But you can see the kind of costs you're looking at. If, if you're doing a, tap, a, a threshold of, of um, one psyllid per tap, you might reach that twice in a season. And, and, and you know, the, the cost of that program is much less than if you're doing point at the point uh, point two cells per tap. You can see the cost of insecticides break. 
One of the things we found, again, and the infection rate's the same. And these thresholds, I, I need to, to, to make it clear here, are not gonna stop the spread of HLB. If you're at the point where you're um, implementing an, an economic threshold, you, you, you've, you've already said, okay, we're, we're, we're not stopping the spread of the pathogen. That's the, that, that, that horse has left the barn. So, you know, that's not a position you want to be in, but that's the position we're in. Um, so this might be, these are some of the decisions you might be making, you know, somewhere down the line and hopefully never. So in this experiment, we found that fruit drop really didn't, didn't matter. You could see the psyllid control, the green, green line here is um, where, we, where we had the lowest threshold. And we, we were able to keep psyllids lower. And we're just uh, processing the yield data now. And um, I, I didn't, I actually made this slide today still, <laughs> I did, but I didn't have the yield data. But the, the, even though they're not statistically analyzed, it didn't look like there was any difference between these three thresholds in, in yield, unfortunately. But you could see that we, um, um, the, it certainly, we, we spent a lot more money uh, on trying to maintain the psyllid populations lower. And if it's true that the yield wasn't higher, then, then that would not have made sense. So what have we been doing in Florida? What I think is a better model in, under conditions of endemic HLB. So what we were what we were doing is after we would after harvest we would apply a dormant spray during the dormant winter period, um, and and this was going along with what uh, Jawad Qureshi said: dormant spray with a really heavy insecticide when, when we thought our uh, impact on biological control would be lowest. Um, and this was try, we tried to time this before a major spring flush using a pyrethroid and organophosphate. And then thereafter, schedules were essentially made on intervals determined by the, the length of efficacy of the insecticide. So this was a, a calendar treadmill. This, um, this resulted in um, a widespread uh, appearance of, uh, of insecticide resistance. It was very spotty in, in certain areas. It was worse than others, but it was apparent throughout the state. And, and it was, we certainly affected biological controls negatively and it became economically um, just not feasible. So growers have really uh, in Florida stepped away from, from this treadmill approach. One possible better alternative that we're um, looking at is spray fills at, at bud break. This, this gets at Mudicetamouse quiz question, not during a full flush, but at the very beginning, just as those buds are breaking um, and before the feather flush is apparent uh, uh, upon which adults can lay eggs. So you're trying to really time it. So you gotta, you gotta really look at the phenology of your tree. And then we apply a second spray application on the flush as psyllids begin to reappear. This seems to achieve about 60 days of low psyllid populations. And then we hold off, then we don't spray. And I'm trying to figure out until what threshold we reach. And it's somewhere there between 0.2 to, and, and one syllab per tap. But it might be in some areas as high as, as one syllab per tap. So here's an area where we did this, where we looked at um, just the calendar approach, hammering syllabs versus um, this, this phenology model plus um, the um, keeping syllabs below um, one syllab per tap. And, and the, the solid lines indicate that um, um, uh, grower practice where, um, where applications are made near flushing periods, but pretty much on a calendar basis. And, and dash lines indicate the bud break model. And we got higher yield where we did the flush model and, and, and tried to implement threshold. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't tremendously greater, but it was, it was better. Um, so so I, th I think there's something to this. And one, the other thing is we looked at um, um, whether the two methods had any impact on, um, on titer of sea loss in the trees. Because with the, the flush phenology model, we had fewer psyllids throughout the trial. And it had no impact. I mean, the, the titer was, was the same in both treatments. And, and, and this field result is pretty much 
congruent with those controlled in, in inoculation investigations in the in the lab, where it doesn't appear that the frequency of infection affects the titer of the bacteria in the tree. It's that insect pathogen interaction um, that, that that I, I think is important in, in, in determining the impact on, on plant health. And, and, and both are having the combination of the two are, are having a negative impact. So to dispraise matter when all your trees are infected, you, everybody's sick. Um, so CLS titer doesn't appear to be related to inoculation frequency. It appears that psyllid density uh, instead uh, is related to tree stress. More psyllids cause higher damage, which compromises tree health. Um, if the pest population and resulting damage that it's causing is sufficiently low, um, we have evidence that it does not pay to take control measures. Again, realize that I have underlined the title there when all trees have HLB. Um, as the pest population continues to rise, um, it reaches a point where the resulting damage, or in this case, perhaps the re reduced impact on, on, on the tree's ability to defend itself against the pathogen, it, it would justify taking control measures. Um, and one ACP per tap is a working ballpark threshold, but um, I think our data are going to bear out that the threshold is going to have to be perhaps lower than that in, in, in certain inst instances. I don't think this is going to be a one-size-fits-all, but it, it's, it's been kind of a working ballpark. So what's in the store for the future of citrus and flora? Well, I think that our stopgap measures will continue to improve. And, and I think we're, 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 we've, we've certainly improved since you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and, and, and we're getting better at, at, at keeping uh, trees healthy. And I think these systems approaches where, where you approach it from multiple different efforts, the, the pathogen, the, the vector control, um, appropriate investment of, of it versus, you know, and, and, and tree health. We're learning more about what to do to keep those roots healthy. So integrating these complementary approaches to, it's, it's to reduce tree stress. It's all about reducing tree stress when all trees are sick. Um, significant progress is being made in, in, in tolerance um, and, and, and breeding. An example is, you know, breeding with, 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 with to breeding in tolerant genes that, that support this strong uh, immune response. And, and a lot of it's tied to, a, you can measure it by, for example, by that salicylic acid response. Um, there's a lot of genetic engineering, um, again, for increased immune response, uh, expression of antimicrobial peptides. We're even, you know, we're even investigating uh, expression of, of BT pesticidal proteins. Uh, of course, this is going to rely upon consumer acceptance, and and um, and it's going to require uh, putting in new tree inventory. Um, and and we're exploring growing citrus indoors, uh, smaller earlier fruiting varieties, and 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 looking at various ways to to prevent the the uh, uh, the, the pathogen from being inoculated in the first place. So okay, um, I'm ready to go to my questions. Um, to, uh, here are all the people that um, really get the work done in my laboratory that I'd like to thank. All right, thank you. Um, so with that, I will open it up for questions. We don't have a lot of time and we have lots of questions, so we'll try and keep it uh, concise. Um, the first question that I have, I believe, is for uh, Dr. Qureshi. This question is, how did the mealybug destroyer beetle perform in terms of ACP reduction compared to the ladybird beetles and lace wings? Uh, we have not... Uh tested a really uh, mealybug destroyer on the Asian citrus salad yet. So I really cannot comment uh, on that. Uh, we did test the convergent lady beetle. And like I said, they were, they were good under laboratory settings and all that. Uh, but when releases were made in the field, uh, we really did not see uh, their establishment. But one thing with the mealybug destroyer is, uh, it's, it's again, it's a generous predator, but it's it's more specific. I think uh, there were some initial experiments we did, but I don't have any conclusive uh, 
on those, but uh, it's it's more specific toward minibugs. Uh, probably, and I don't know if we'll, uh, how much impact we'll see on the Asian citrus. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question, I believe, is for Mamudu, um, but it might apply to the others as well. So this question is. Is it possible to manip manipulate flush cycles through irrigation or fertilization to help manage flush cycle? What effect might this have on overall yield? Uh, HLB alters flush cycles and how might this influence this management approach? I think, you know, you can manipulate flush cycle using horticultural practices, especially if you use, if the trees are water stress, and you irrigate, certainly you will have flush, you know, being produced immediately after. And uh, of course, whenever you manipulate flush cycle and you have flush being produced, uh, you will recruit more silid if you silly are endemic in your area. So certainly you have to be ready to, to, to spray. I know there are some uh, trial done in China and maybe here, I don't know if it's in Florida where they were trying to suppress, you know, flow cycle. So I don't know, what, you know, if you suppress flow cycle, certainly in the long term, you may affect your yield potential if you constantly suppress flow cycle, but it requires some spray, you know, to do that. But definitely whenever you irrigate and the trees are water stressed before irrigation, you can, uh, you know, produce more flushes, not just, you know, reduce it. But now, if you reduce irrigation, you know, to prevent flush cycle, certainly this will have a negative impact on your yield. So personally, uh, I'm not a horticulturalist per se, but I'm sure any horticultural practice that manipulate flush cycle will have some consequences on yield. Now, re related to HLB, what we've noticed, you know, uh, the HLB affected trees, the phenology of the tree changes. And certainly if you have more flush should be produced, you may recruit more silid on those HLB affected trees. I don't know what is the observation of Lucas in Florida. You know, what, uh, what are your observation on the HLB affected trees? Yeah, the, the, they produce a lot of flush so, off cycle. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, um, it, it's, uh, almost it's a um, it's a characteristic of the disease that um, uh, I, I'm not sure if there was a, a selection pressure for it or not but uh, the consequence is it, it probably facilitates greater spread of pathogen okay um, the next question I think is for uh, Lucas it's in Florida, do high ACP populations also negatively affect fruit juice quality in 100% sea loss infective gro infected grove? That's a good question. Um, and I don't believe that that has been, um, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone actually ever uh, looking at that. I, I would speculate uh, a guess, um, that the tree would compensate for it. Um, and that what you would see is uh, a reduction of yield in, in you know, numbers of fruit produced. And, uh, but um, it's an interesting hypothesis. Okay, thank you. I do have a question for Mamudu regarding the cold freeze in Texas. One person asked what happened to your groves? And then another person asked what this does to ACP and beneficial insects. Okay, uh, this is an interesting question because um, uh, the short-term impact to our citrus industry is that we lost 50% of our grapefruit production for the season. And we lost 100% of our Valencia oranges. Uh, you may be aware of uh, how we harvest grapefruit here. We do ring picking. Gra any grapefruit grove is harvested twice. The first pass we do from uh, October all the way to January, we pick up uh, the larger fruit first and give time to the smaller fruit to grow. 
and those smaller fruit are generally harvested, uh, you know, this second crop is generally harvested from uh, February all the way to early May or late April, depending on the season. So we've lost entirely those two crops for this season. Now, the freeze also has some impact on uh, the tree health. All the trees that were two years old and younger, most of them are dead. Now, the mature growth is still there. We lost all the foliage. I don't know if you saw the picture I presented. Those leaves are brown on the ground and uh, the twig, we have a lot of twig die back. It's now those trees are flushing back, but we don't know yet the extent of the twig die back. But what is sure, uh, this year, you know, this coming season, crop will also be negatively affected. We don't know the extent of that, but we, we, we may guess we'll have like 40% or less of our crop for this coming year. So this is what we are seeing, you know, in our growth. Now, how does it affect beneficial? It affects both beneficial and pest. So we did some monitoring um, from February 16 or 17 up to date we were able to see only one infested flush shoot. We have not seen any beneficial arthropod out there because we don't have the pest. We don't have psyllid, we don't have aphid. So we have not noted any predator out there. So the freeze will negatively affect both pest and uh, you know, the beneficial. But we need to keep in mind that those pests have a high reproductive capacity. So whenever very few survive, and with the warmer weather, they can rebound back and rebuild back population very rapidly. So we expect by summer to see, to be back up already, because this is not the first time we have this freezing event. It's, uh, the last freeze was 89. And after that freeze, we got silly and other pests back and other beneficial. So this is what I think. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this next question I believe is for uh, Jawad, um, the question is, do you have the ant issues that we have in California um, that make it harder for predators to be able to thrive? Again, definitely we have that issue. I have not tested that myself, but we do see um, the ants of the, on the developing colonies of, uh, of the Asian citrus alert names. And we, we have some observations where we have seen interference with the predators and uh, parasites. Okay, so this one is for the Florida researchers. So that's Lucas and Jawad. Um, what would be the best approach to control ACP in California? I, my opinion right now would be uh, zero tolerance. Whatever that requires, whatever economic input that requires. Okay, does anyone else want to respond to that or should I move on to the next question? Just, just keep in mind that if, if while on that track, you make sure that the tools are the, are the products that you have. Uh, uh, you are uh, making good rotations and keeping in mind that you are uh, not repeating the same chemistries uh, again and again. Uh, yeah. I, I support the dead tolerance uh, and it needs to start with intensive monitoring because you don't want to have any silly reproducing in your you know, main producing area and uh, I always compare that to a situation. If you have any silly somewhere that is established, with time you will always have HLB. You know, one cannot take comfort and said we have reproducing population of silly and we don't have HLB. We've been through that uh, here in Texas for years. We've said that we have silly, but we do not have HLB. So uh, because we did not have a proof of the presence of HLB. An absence of proof is not a proof of absence. So whenever you have reproducing silic population, you should expect to have HLB, you know, CLAS and HLB somewhere. So at all cost, you should have zero tolerance 
it's not time to think about biocontrol of silage in your commercial growth. You may do that in other residential and non-managed habitat, but in um, commercial growth, it is chemical control, intensive monitoring followed by chemical control. Yeah, I mean, otherwise, if, if you take the other approach, then, then my talk was much more um, appropriate <laughs> because that's what it's gonna take. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, would you like to continue or should no, I move on? No. Go right. on? Okay, I believe this question is for Lucas. Uh, have you looked at ACP pressure after, oh, um, I think it might be after topping activities. In California, it is one way to force growth to happen on your schedule. Does ACP prefer tops or sides? Yeah, uh, we, um, uh, back when, um, we initi initiated monitoring for symptoms. We uh, would go through groves with these um, contraptions that allowed um, the, uh, the monitoring crew to look at tops of trees for, for HLB symptoms. And we quickly realized it's, that's where a lot of the psyllids are, particularly on, on large trees. Now, topping is gonna create the growth of that new flush, as Mamudu discussed. That's, that's where the psyllids go. That's their only place to lay eggs and um, for the nymphs to reproduce. Also, the insects themselves are, um, they're, they're naturally inclined to move upwards and they're naturally inclined to move towards the light. So really the, the tops, that's, that's where they wanna go. Um, so um, really that's where we, um, we tend to try to monitor uh, if, if we're trying to give up, get our, our most conservative estimates of, of, of populations. And, and if you're working with really mature groves, you know, 20 foot trees, you, you really have to keep an eye on what's going up on up there because that's, that's where the, a lot of them will, will be located. They tend to fly along the treetops. Um, is, um, you know, so if, however, large those trees get, that's, that's where they are. Thank you. Um, this next question I think is for Jawad. Um, the question is, as far as predators are concerned, do, I think it might be cry proteins, it's C-R-Y-P, have the same impact as do convergent lady beetles? Mm, I did not understand the question. Cry are, those are the BT pesticidal proteins. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear the question. I, I wasn't because it was for Jawad, so I tuned out. <laughs> yeah, the, the question says, do crypt have the same impact as two? Probably cryptolemus. I think the beetle or oh. the cry No, cry protein. Yes, well, cry protein would be the BT pesticidal proteins. We are, we are working on that, and they... Well, I'll just say from my experience that when th this is an early phase of investigation and we have been able to get um, uh, in the laboratory, we've been able to get citrus to express um, cryoproteins and we've been able to show that psyllids feeding on those uh, on very specific cryoproteins um, are killed. But no, th they act very differently and cryproteins have never been tested in a field setting. Um, okay, so we do have clarification from the person asking the question. Crip is short for cryptolamus. Oh. I'm not sure if, they're, if you're able to comment on that. Okay, I think for the time being, let's move on to the next question. We have a little bit of time left. Um, Frank has asked, what is this current status of insecticide resistance in Texas and Florida? So anyone who would like to jump in can take that one. Well, Texas was first. 
I don't know if you want to go for somebody. Okay. So anyway, um, I will get in. Um, what we've noticed here, you know, we had uh, an overuse of uh, neonicotinoids, especially imidacloprid, uh, because of, uh, you know, certainly lower cost and uh, early effectiveness. So we've documented, you know, it through a student project that has not been published yet, some areas where we have lower, you know, residual control with imidacloprid. But again, this can reverse back very rapidly if a grower doesn't use it uh, for you know, maybe a couple of months, it can reverse back. But what we documented is imidacloprid, we have uh, uh, some kind of resistance in uh, some commercial growth. And this is the only one we studied. So we have not documented in uh, other areas. We are limited here in personnel on, uh, we can study all the different aspects of entomology. That is why I know in Florida, some studies have been done on uh, the various uh, insecticides. But in Texas, we have not documented uh, resistance to other other insecticide except maybe imidacloprid. Um, in, in Florida, it uh, remains very spotty. We have we have found um, that we can um, uh, mitigate the problem entirely by effective rotation with five modes of action, and we can go into places where growers have had product failure with a middle cloprid and then institute um, a, a, a five mode of action rotation and literally with, with the first spray, get that population back into control. And within about six to eight months, see um, a reversion of, of, of susceptibility levels to pre-resistant type um, uh, responses. The thing is, those those populations then remain primed uh, in in that, that there is a there appears or we've documented a permanent allelic uh, change in uh, in those populations where that they'll just like Mamudu mentioned they'll, they'll they'll reverse back to resistance within fewer generations than it took initially, um, but as long as you maintain a five product mode of action rotation, the the, the problem is non-existent. Okay, I think we'll do one more question before we leave. Um, this question I think is for Mamudu. It's, did I understand correctly that there was a correlation between titers, sea loss and flush cycles? If so, does that imply PCR testing is best done during flush? I think Yes, there is a correlation between, uh, you know, on uh, Lucas's data, there is a strong correlation between flush cycle and the uh, sea last titer, even in the old leaves. So if you are sampling and you want to do PCR testing of old leaf during your flush cycle, you have the best chance of detecting sea last. I, I would agree with that. And I'd also give a caveat that those data are based on estimated titers. And what we're able to do is we're usually able to correctly identify a positive tree, even when the titers are at the lowest. So a lot of these diagnostic PCR tests will, will still tell a positive when it's a positive. So we're just, we're, we're looking at when, it, you know, titers, amount of bacteria there. Nonetheless, if I wanted to be <laughs> very sure uh, I, I would do it when it's flushing, yeah. But you you, you probably still correctly um, identify a, a positive tree when, you know, during off flush. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lucas, sorry about that. Um, so we are out of time for today. Thank you to all of you for speaking. This has been very informative and thank you for everyone who um, stayed on. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day.